hope to do is to uh, introduce um, how the bronchoscope is used, how its uh, patients prepared for its use, and some of the um, tr tricks of the trade for getting a patient comfortable and educating them. UC Davis Healthcare Bronchoscopy Consent, providing exceptional healthcare through innovation and education. Why do you need a bronchoscopy? Or what are the benefits of having a bronchoscopy? Bronchoscopy is usually done to find the cause of a lung problem, but there are also other reasons why a bronchoscopy can be done. Here are a few of the most common reasons why a bronchoscopy is performed. Bronchoscopy can be used to obtain samples of mucus or tissue that can be sent for further testing in a lab. Bronchoscopy may also show signs of infection, sites of bleeding, or something that may be blocking an airway, for example food, mucus plug, or a tumor. There are also times when bronchoscopy is used to treat a lung problem, such as putting in a stent. A stent is a small tube to hold the airways open. So why do we do a bronchoscopy? Well, predominantly for diagnosis. Um, and uh, what we're going to uh, touch on is only diagnostic procedures. The um, whole process starts with an indication, trying to figure out would the patient benefit from a bronchoscopy. And that really has to be decided between the physician who's taking care of the patient and the patient uh, willing to undergo the modest risk. The risks are mostly associated with um, uh, the medications which we use particularly uh, conscious sedation, which is the way most of the patients are managed. What is a bronchoscopy? Bronchoscopy is a procedure that is commonly used to see inside of your lungs. A camera inside a very small lighted tube, called a bronchoscope, is inserted through your mouth or nose. Many times before and during the procedure, you will receive medications to numb your throat or nasal passages. The bronchoscope is then used to examine your throat and lungs either through the tube or on a video screen. This will be portrayed on the next slide. If needed, the bronchoscope makes it possible to advance different types of special tools to collect samples of lung tissue or fluid. To prepare patients uh, and to make the procedure more comfortable, we administer intravenous anesthetics occasionally and certainly analgesics topically and intravenous sedatives to keep them comfortable but not completely knocked out. Um, takes away their anxiety. They'll also be on uh, medications, uh, narcotics particularly, to decrease their uh, cough reflex so they're un not as uncomfortable. Two other ways that we keep patients comfortable and prepare them for it are with topical anesthetics, which is a large part of the preparatory process. And the other one is just informing patients. There's a couple of studies that asked patients what they found most uncomfortable about bronchoscopies. And in retrospect, it was the fear of the unknown and uh, not knowing what to expect. They didn't complain of the cough, which we often can see. They complained a little bit about the bad tasting medicines, but they understood that as part of the procedure. Um, and that was it. They really didn't complain of pain. They didn't complain of uh, anything but the anxiety. Once the patient's prepared uh, and the crew is ready to uh, perform the procedure, the uh, bronchoscope is usually inserted through the nostrils. There's a triangular passage which is formed in the nose uh, underneath the nasal turbinate. And through this passageway is usually the largest uh, space through which you could pass the flexible uh, bronchoscope. Anything you notice other than pressure, you let us know. Okay, great. A steady, firm pressure with a little bit of flexion is usually used to allow it to be passed smoothly. If a patient has significant pain, we should reassess the patency of the, of the nasal passage and consider an oral route. The oral route, many of us find, is more difficult, uh, probably because there's more soft tissue to negotiate past rather than a nice wide open cavity that's held open by bony prominences. Once the, the patient's been intubated essentially with this bronchoscope, further direct ins installation of the lidocaine will be applied to the vocal cords. At the posterior pharynx, an inspection is performed examining the uh, volecula, which are the spaces next to on either side of the epiglottis. Visualization of the false cords can help find whether or not the patient has acid reflux or other signs of aspiration. And the vocal cords themselves can be noted to have either lesions and also good function where they normally oppose on phonation. And we often ask patients to phonate with letter E to uh, make them oppose their vocal cords. Everything's going very well, Bill. No obstructions in your nose. Looks great. We're now looking down at your... There are instances when a sedative is needed to complete the procedure. 
This is usually avoided unless absolutely necessary, as these sedatives come with their own added risk. For example, an allergic reaction to the sedation, a depressed respiratory drive, or drop in blood pressure. What should I expect during the bronchoscopy? The initial placement of the bronchoscope has been described as being uncomfortable. We anticipate this and use a local anesthetic to numb either your nasal passages and or a liquid local anesthetic for your throat and vocal cords. Cough is a very common symptom experienced during bronchoscopy. This is a natural reflex and is usually controlled with local anesthetic. Gagging is also a very common symptom experienced during bronchoscopy. This too is a natural reflex and can be controlled with local anesthetic. Unfortunately, with all of the medications we give, at times patients do feel pain, but we do our best to control this by using the local anesthetic. Once the patient has been informed of the risks uh, and the benefits of the procedure, it really has to do with topical anesthetics. We're not gonna cover, as I mentioned, conscious sedation. Topical uh, administration of uh, analgesics, particularly uh, lidocaine is applied in four different methods, four different ways. One is through nebulization, another is through atomization or spraying directly into the posterior pharynx, nose, or back of the throat. Another method is by directly applying a viscous lidocaine. A fourth way is transmucosal uh, nerve block of the glossopharyngeal nerve using a Jackson forceps holding a cotton uh, wad that's filled with lidocaine. The choice is up to the operator on which of these methods to use. Most of us will end up using all four depending on the gag reflex or the status of the patient. Certainly in an intubated patient, such careful anesthetics are not necessary. What many of us find uh, useful is that the application of the Jackson Pratt's often will test the patient's gag reflex as well. So it's a good marker as to whether or not you fully anesthetize the patient. And usually the last thing that we do prior to starting the procedure. So it's going to go past your teeth and then sort of where your tonsils are, just past those, okay? So it's going to go in there, and if you have to cough, just hit me. Open wide, a little wider for me. A little wider, a little wider. Okay. Yeah, tongue down for me, try not to hide me. There you go, great. You feel it sort of pushing against the side of your mouth in the back? Excellent. Okay, great. The British Thoracic Society recommends the use of viscous lidocaine for the nasal passages because it does two things. It keeps the lidocaine present to uh, achieve better anesthesia, and it also uh, allows for lubrication through the tight nasal passages. What are the complications for bronchoscopy? Flexible bronchoscopy is an extremely safe procedure, and the chance of something going wrong is minimal. The chance of having something go wrong during a bronchoscopy is hard to determine and may also depend on your medical history. Please ask your physician how this may affect you after this presentation. What are the major life-threatening complications for bronchoscopy? Some of the common major life-threatening complications include respiratory depression. This tends to occur more frequently with sedatives. This is one of the reasons why we don't encourage the use of sedatives for our procedure unless it's absolutely necessary. Infections like pneumonia can also occur after a bronchoscopy. This is usually treated with antibiotics. Pneumothorax can be defined as leakage of air from the lungs into the pleural space. There's a slight increased risk of having pneumothorax with lung biopsies. Airway obstruction with the bronchoscope is another common major life-threatening complication. Arrhythmias, which means irregular heartbeats and possibly heart attacks. Homoptysis, which is bleeding in the lung, can be due to friable tissue from disease or biopsies. What are the minor non-life-threatening complications for bronchoscopy? Minor non-life-threatening complications include in order of frequency, vasovagal reactions, fever, Cardiac arrhythmias, airway obstruction with the bronchoscope, pneumothorax, nausea and vomiting. What are the risks for biopsies taken with bronchoscopy? The major risks for biopsies taken with bronchoscopy are homoptysis, 
which is bleeding in the lungs, usually, which is very minimal, or pneumothorax, which is leakage of air from the lungs. What happens if I get a pneumothorax? Pneumothorax, once again, is defined as air leakage from the lung. The majority of cases of people who have pneumothorax after bronchoscopy are minor and do not need any intervention. Pneumothoraxes that become more complicated may require a chest tube and oxygen. This can be seen in the next slide. Treatments for a large pneumothorax is usually with oxygen in a chest tube. The chest tube and the procedure related to it will be explained more in depth by your physician during that time. The time frame for how long it takes for a pneumothorax to resolve and how long a chest tube is left in depends on the situation and is difficult to give a specific time frame. Vital things that we should be aware of. There are different instances that require physicians to address more thoroughly. Please let the physician after this presentation or pulmonary staff member know if any of these conditions apply to you. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, also known as COPD. If you do not have a spleen. If you have had heart valve prosthesis or endocarditis. If you have had a recent heart attack less than six weeks ago. If you have eaten solid food within the last four hours prior to this procedure. Or if you're currently taking aspirin, Coumadin, or known as warfarin, Plavix, or any other anticoagulation medications. What are the alternatives to bronchoscopy? If you are still uncertain about going through with this procedure, please let us know and we will do our best to address any concerns you may have. There are other non-invasive methods that may benefit you in finding more about your lung disease, such as x-rays, CT scans, MRI, or ultrasound. Each case is different and may require different methods of imaging. Although there are alternatives, it is most likely that you have already received these imaging techniques and that is why you were referred to get a bronchoscopy. We respect every patient's decision and if you should decide to not do this bronchoscopy, the alternative would be to continue on with your current medical management. We hope that this quick presentation may have addressed many of the questions you may have had. And if we didn't, please feel free to ask us. We do believe that through this innovative presentation and education, we can provide you with exceptional health care. We thank you for choosing our pulmonary service here at UC Davis Healthcare. In today's competitive marketplace, we appreciate you have many choices for your pulmonary needs. We pride ourselves on honoring our patient and our continued commitment is to provide you with the warm, personal, caring, prompt, and professional service you deserve. We look forward to serving you in the future, and once again, thank you. A physician will be with you shortly to obtain consent, as well as answer any other questions or concerns you may have. Once again, we thank you and please let us know how we can better our care for you in the future.